Good afternoon, everyone. We're so happy to be here today with Jack and Stephanie from the zoo and Amanda from Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. Many of you know me. I'm Kristen Dare Horsley. I work here in the education department. And um, Gail and I were so excited. We actually, when we decided to meet, you know, in advance for this one, we were like, yo, we'll go to you at the zoo. That'll be no problem. So, um, but Jack and I um, and, you know, TBEC Education and Nashville Zoo have actually had a pretty long partnership. I, I think um, we've done a whole lot of things together. They've actually brought animals on stage with the opera before with their show Aida. Um, but we, the first time the Lion King was here all those years ago, we decided that we would like to have animals here at TPAC in the lobby and whatnot. And so surprisingly, they actually do that kind of thing. And so they, for our gala, they brought animals and they were in the lobby with like a snake and a parrot and a big cat and some other things and that was fantastic and then we also found out that they have a wonderful education program and so we actually had workshops where we would take students and children that were coming to see shows like The Lion King to the zoo and have wonderful workshops there so we have a long time partnership and anytime we can work together we're happy to do it and um, we actually worked with them last year we did for their uh, zoo staff that does the the shows there, the animal shows. One of you know, the wonderful Laddie Brown, who moderated last month, you all know her. She did an acting class for them, and um, that sort of sparked the idea for us to bring them back for a lunchbox, so that you all could learn about the wonderful education programs that they do at the Nashville Zoo. And of course, um, our Vanderbilt connection today, the zoo actually once a month takes animals to the Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. And so we're going to talk about that as well. So let's welcome the panel today. And we're just going to go ahead and start with, uh, with Scarlett over here that's sitting very nicely with Miss Jack. I'm going to stand up with Scarlett over here because she needs her own microphone. But um, <laughs> there we go. Can you, can you say hello to everybody? Can you say hello? Ah. Yeah, there you go. So she does talk. Um, but uh, we are very happy to be here today. And one of the things that Kristen talked to me about was um, how we do performance at the zoo. And of course, we do performance with animals <laughs> in our education, uh, educational shows and other offerings that we have. So Scarlet is a bird that's been with us for a very long time. She's actually in her 20s. She's a Scarlet macaw. And they're from the rainforests of Central and South America. But Scarlett, uh, Kristen asked if we could kind of do an example of some of the performances that we do. So Scarlett a lot of times starts a show. And so we have her come out and start with a great big wave. There you go. Good girl. And of course, you heard her say hello. But she also says hi. Can you say hi? Hi. Yeah, hi. <laughs> and then, of course, she does like to tell people her name. What's your name? Oh, you've got a mouthful. Sorry. What's your name? What's your name? Scarlet. Scarlet, that's right. <laughs> and uh, you, you're, pretty, you're something else, aren't you? You're pretty funny. Yeah, you're a pretty funny girl. Now, she also does a few other things. She likes to do some dancing. Do a little dancing. She, she offered that behavior one time. She actually naturally does that. Um, we listen to the radio while we're working because not only do we get to do wonderful things like this, <laughs> but uh, Stephanie and I also and our other coworkers uh, do all the cleaning and the feeding of these animals and take care of them and train them. So um, <clears throat> we listen to music. And when we were cleaning one day, uh, we were listening to a station that was playing a variety of music, and the song Respect by Aretha Franklin came on. And I turned around, I'm not kidding you, this is the truth, Scarlett was doing this. So I ran over and I gave her a treat, and then we put it on cue. And um, that's how we're able to get these, these things. Um, macaws naturally mimic and imitate each other in the wild. That's how they learn from each other. So when they've been raised around people, they naturally mimic and imitate us. And not just in what we say by saying hello and things like that, but also doing those movements. But Scarlett does all these things on cue, and she knows she gets a great treat when she does a good job. But she does a couple other things. Let's see, I'm trying to remember what else her cues are. I'm used to doing a show and kind of rolling with it. So I have my little script in my head, but we're a little off today. Let's see. So we said hello and hi, and oh, when you really like someone, don't you give them a big kiss? Give them a big kiss. Yeah, that's a good girl. And uh, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's any cues I forgot that you do. Everything we have is either a vocal cue, like she hears a word I say, or I do a little hand signal. I think the last one actually is the one we always end on, and that is wave and tell them bye-bye. Yeah, that's a good girl. So she did a very good job for us today. I think she was a good girl. I'm going to go ahead and put her up. <laughs> Scarlet is quite the diva. We love Scarlet. 
And um, so, Stephanie, can you kind of tell us what kinds of performances take place at the zoo? Well, we have um, everyday performances. We do three shows a day. So, and we have three separate shows that our staff learn. Our first one this year is going to be a training show, so we can kind of show everybody how we get the animals to do what they do on stage. So it's a lot of fun. And we use a lot of animals that are in training in that show, so it gives them a, a, a good practice in front of an audience as well. And where does that happen? Uh, in our um, auditorium that we have near the Cross Center. Yeah, so. outdoor amphitheater. Amphitheater. <laughs> <laughs> I said auditorium. <laughs> but this year is a little different. We have a, a lot of construction going on, so we're going to work our shows around that. Um, definitely we'll be having shows on the weekends. And then we're also going to do a lot of special animal encounters, so it'll give us an opportunity to see everybody face to face, though. So we're going to get the animals out on the pathway. <coughs> Um, hopefully do some flying of some birds out in Festival Field, and that's going to be new and fun for all of us as well. Excellent. Yeah. And, and you take animals out. Like to, what, what you're doing today is kind of part of a program called, what is that called? Well, it's, we have our Wildlife on Wheels, which has an ambassador program, which this would be, and then also we do school programs. We go to senior centers. Of course, we have mentioned Vanderbilt earlier. Um, we definitely, we, we go just about anywhere because we're not just wanting to share the animals with people, but, um, and it's not necessarily just for the promotion of the zoo, though that's nice. It's um, to teach people about the animals and conservation, and that's the main um, drive that we have. So um, any opportunity we get to kind of increase awareness and appreciation for these animals and for wildlife is something that we want to do. So to, to train these animals and work with them so they can be in, comfortable in all kinds of environments um, it can be challenging, but it is something that is definitely worthwhile because there's many times, you know, we love to have people visit us at the zoo and see the shows we do there, but to get to take them out to, to people who maybe can't come see us um, is really important, and that's one reason why we love that relationship that we have with Vanderbilt is because in that situation, you know, not everyone there would be able to come see us, and so mm -hmm, we can bring mm -hmm. the animals there and let them experience that. Yeah, so Mandy, talk about that a little bit. Um, how important is it? You just had this morning, they had a, a poodle. <laughs> a, well, yes. well, yeah, talk, talk about how important it is for the patients there and why you would bring animals in in the first place to a hospital. Yeah, um, so just a little background. Um, I'm a child life specialist by training, so our job in the hospital setting is to make sure that kids and families um, kind of understand what goes on while they're there, um, as well as promoting play and normalization and diversion and education. Um, and so the way we do that is through people like the Nashville Zoo, like Jack just said, um, some of our kids may never get to go to the zoo um, because their immune systems maybe just aren't strong enough to be around that many people. Um, and so we try to bring things to the hospital that help normalize the environment. So the zoo is one of those examples. Um, and what kind of an effect does it have on them? Like, um, is there like a psychological effect that it makes them feel better or? Um, so some of you might know um, just in general about pet therapy. We have a pet therapy program at the Children's Hospital. Um, animals in general, through research, we found that they have, you know, a therapeutic effect um, on all people, not just patients and families, um, but in particular those who are sick, which is why we have, you know, our pet therapy dogs that can visit. We had Maggie, the performing poodle, this morning that came and um, performed. She's, a, she's from L.A., and she came all the way to Nashville uh, to share her tricks with us. She's in movies and TV shows and um, can do over 100 tricks, so the kids found that very, not only is it entertaining, it's also um, therapeutic because they get to pet Maggie and, um, and see her. So any animal um, that comes into the hospital, kids um, love to pet them and spend time with them. And, and what does that look like in the hospital? Like, do the kids go to a performance space do, or do the animals go to them? How that's, does that work? That's a great question. So it depends on which animal it is. <laughs> um, our normal pet therapy dogs do go upstairs to the rooms. Their um, owners are trained volunteers that we train. Um, about working in the hospital setting, and they um, they go room to room and see the kids that they're able to see, um, and then people like the zoo um, 
the performing poodle, we have also miniature um, therapy horses that come. Um, those all happen at our performance stage. So at the Children's Hospital, we have uh, a performance stage. We call it the butterfly stage because it's got um, these butterflies <laughs> on plaques all around it. You've, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so all of our special events that we majority of our special events that we do happen at that stage. About how many kids participate? <laughs> One to 25. It just depends on the day. Um, it depends on the time of year. In the winter, we don't have as many kids that can come out of the room. So, um, But we have this really awesome thing called closed circuit television where we have a camera at the stage. And so those kids that can't come out of their rooms and participate can still watch what's happening um, in their rooms on their TVs. Um, so that's a really awesome feature that helps those kids that can't come out still participate um, in special events. Oh, that's really cool. So do you like, do they, um, do you announce what animals are coming? <laughs> or do so they just like show up in the kids' rooms? <laughs> um, for the zoo, it's always a surprise. We don't tell the kids. What, it's a surprise to me. I never know what animal's coming either. Um, it's usually a handful of things. Because we are in a hospital setting, we do have some infection control um, rules that not all animals from the zoo can come. Um, so we have, I'd say, a handful of maybe... Yeah, we have... I mean, what we do is the way six. we've worked with Vanderbilt is we've gave them a list of the animals that we have that go out, and then they're other infectious control department <laughs> picks through the whole thing and tells us all what we're allowed to bring and if there's any parameters. So um, some things we could bring but could only leave in a container. Some things we, we rather just bring the animals and have them be out. So from that list, we work with that. And so what Robin, who is our outreach program supervisor, does is she decides what can go based on what's available, what we have available if it's not working, and also what she knows. Maybe she hasn't taken it in a while, or maybe she would like to give a different experience, but she's always looking to see. So sometimes when we've turned things in and we've asked them and they've said no, and then sometimes later we're like, but please, we sent like a picture of the really cute animal and be like, really? You know, sometimes, you know, they, they make changes, but most of the time it's, um, it's animals that, you know, are the lowest risk. And then some things they say it's okay to let children touch these animals, sometimes it's not. And so... Um, we, if, if there's not a huge group and we can allow them to have that contact experience, we will do that. If it's a really big group, maybe not because it's a little much for the animals. And then it also depends on the animal. Um, you know, if we were to take one of the cats, they, we don't let people touch them, but they can be out there. So um, it, it just depends on what we have. But we definitely um, run everything by and, and make sure we're working very closely with y'all to make sure yes. that it, it fits with what they need but still gives the kids a great experience. Mm -hmm. And the parents too, by the way. They seem to really like it. Yes, it's really important not just for patients um, but also for siblings as well as parents um, and family members that are spending time at the hospital. It's also a therapeutic experience for them as well. So that, That's wonderful. That makes a lot of sense. So when you do the shows, with the animals, how do you go about, you know, how do you go about, write, you write them all, right? Yes, yes we do. And you make up characters, so you're basically making up little plays. Yeah, basically, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the animals are the stars. Yes, right? yes, they are. So talk about your process for doing that and how it changes from sort of venue to venue. Well, um, it, it, what we do is, um, for instance, for our regular shows, we kind of get together as a group and we look at our animals that we'd like to feature and what the venue is. So if it's something large like this, we're going to have bigger animals in it so more people can see better. Um, you know, smaller venues, maybe something smaller. But like for our regular shows, we're going to look at our animal list, kind of what we need to do. We know that it's got to be fast-paced, got to have a lot of animals in it. Visitors who come and they want to sit down for 20 minutes, but they want to get what they feel like 20 minutes worth is because they want to keep walking around the zoo and look at everything else. So we need to keep it moving pretty quickly. And then we work together on how, what do we want to feature about that animal? What conservation message or what appreciation message are we wanting to feature with this particular animal? And then we work backwards from there. So for our regular shows, they may not be as character driven. Our, our Halloween shows, we have an event called Ghouls at Grassmere. We go crazy. Um, <laughs> we create characters and it's just, it's really fun. It's, mm -hmm. And we throw in all sorts of jokes. We try to have, we try to sort of be like Sesame Street or the Muppets, have jokes for the adults and the kids. 
Um, so like one year we had a character where it was like the mad scientist or the crazy professor, I guess it was, and his assistant Igor. And we felt like that was good for the parents who maybe watched Young Frankenstein, you know. Yeah. But, um, you know, the kids just thought it was funny, you know. And, and so we, we have... We do that, but then when you're working with animals, you have to keep it pretty loose. So, yeah, we do write things. We may write a few lines and say, we definitely want to get this line in, but um, you have to be really good at improv <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you work with animals and then also children in an audience and uh, random things can happen and you just you never know what you're going to be dealing with. That's right, because everybody's dressed up in uh, superheroes and... You know, you don't know what the animals are going to think. Yeah, <laughs> audience, you know, yeah so. for the Halloween event, but even the regular shows, you know. And then That's when true. Robin goes to programs, she writes um, her programs for outreaches can be anything from a very, you know, loose, informal, like is done at Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. to um, a more formalized education program that meets curriculum standards. So we also have to make a match with all the curriculum, and, and the teachers have to justify bringing this in there. So she'll have... Some theatrical pieces, like dressing kids up in costumes and things to match the animals, but not necessarily having, like it's a little bit more of an, a teaching mm -hmm. experience with the animals doing some things, but she still will sometimes fly the birds or have the talking parrots and, and do things. So it, um, it really is a mix. So the process does, I mean, when we worked with y'all before and we met with Laddie, you know, she, we were like, so here's the thing. <laughs> we're not just writing shows. We're not just performing. We've also got animals. We also need to have a conservation message. We also need to know that we're working with all ages, everything from infants to senior citizens. And um, so what can you do for us? <laughs> so and it was a process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so she helped us a great deal. Let's, if we can bring Miss Jane out. Yes. And you can oh, yeah. show us yes. an example of what one of those shows might be. Yes. And I don't know, how many of you have been to their Ghouls at Grasmere at the zoo. It's really fun, and um, I actually um, um, volunteered last year. I, I, was in, I was in the alien autopsy room, and um, <laughs> I actually scary. had kids, like, I had this big alien, and he had a bunch of worms in there. They weren't real, unfortunately, but, and all the kids <laughs> got to put their hands in the worms and stuff. It was really fun. Yeah, and we, one of the things that we realize is very important for us, um, we're all about people making connections with the animals, and, and a lot of research has shown that when people make a personal connection with something, then they kind of become more involved with it. So we want them to make a personal connection with these animals and then take that personal connection to being more involved in conservation and such. And, and everyone who works in this business, I know Stephanie definitely has these same kinds of stories that I do of growing up, how we can, we can really narrow it down to that one experience maybe in our lifetime that helped us make this connection. So Jane is a great example of an animal that we use for audience participation because a lot of our shows and our educational programs, we do try to bring an audience member up or several or have some kind of participation moment so that people can make that connection even on a personal level. And we do name our animals and all that. So Stephanie can take over from here. <laughs> can we tell a little bit about Jane? Yeah. So Jane's a silvery cheeked hornbill. Are you nervous? It's okay. Now she'll let us do this. And we do use her on Animal Ambassadors, and, and she is one of our touchable animals, so we let um, public touch the back of her. So it's kind of a unique experience for them to be able to touch a hornbill like Jane. And uh, silvery cheek hornbills are from the mountain regions of Africa, and she's very special because um, she's one of about 65, we, we think, in captivity. That's all that there is in captivity here in North America. So it's pretty cool that we have her at the Nashville Zoo. <laughs> she's so friendly today. <laughs> now what she's showing off is her beautiful beak. She's got the huge cask on top. Um, their beaks are hollow, and the cask is thought to help amplify the sounds in those mountain regions of Africa so that they can call and hear each other. Um, but because of the unique shape of her beak here, she has a very unique way of eating food. They're uh, frugivores. They eat lots of fruit. They also eat insects. And so what they'll do is they'll pick that piece of fruit, and they kind of have to toss it back and then swallow it. Um, they'll even do this when they drink water. And in the mornings when she's drinking water out of her bowl, she kind of dips her beak in and then tosses it back. It's kind of neat to watch. <laughs> and in the wild, um, they do live in, in pairs. And the couple will help the, the males, like, feed the female. So what they do is they'll pick that piece of fruit and they'll toss it to the other, and then they eat. It's really kind of sweet. Uh, I wish I could show that off, but... Uh, kind of need help from you all to be our uh, hornbill today. I need a volunteer that'd like to come up here and be a star today. <laughs> Anybody done with their lunch and like to help? Huh? I see There's a, a hand, hand right there. You look so excited. 
come on up here. I think there's stairs on this side. There we go. So this is what we do in our shows as an audience participation. Um, it's nice to include our audiences up on stage too. It's a lot of fun. So what we're going to do is we're going to use some of Jane's favorite food, which are grapes. Are you good at tossing things? <laughs> I have to use her mouth like a like a hornbill. <laughs> Just teasing. Okay, I've got a couple grapes here. <laughs> that would be kind of fun to watch, though. <laughs> okay, and we're kind of out of practice. We've been we've been you know inside over the winter and um, hasn't had a lot of warm weather to go outside and try this. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, let's start kind of close. I'm like pushing it for us. <laughs> let's do a nice underhand toss on the count of three. She's ready. Are you ready? She's kind of watching. You look kind of, okay, ready? One, two, three. Ta -da! Yay! <laughs> Rejected. <laughs> yeah, that one was not very good. <laughs> She's very picky about her grapes. All right. <laughs> well, should we try another? Do you want a different one? Yeah, she was like, that one was just not good. <laughs> Let's try a really far toss. It's going to be awesome. Okay, ready? All right, watch over there. Are you ready? One, two, three. <laughs> the light got in her eyes. Okay, we got one more. We got a backup. Uh oh, it's a squishy one. She's, I already know. She's going to toss this one out. She's like, that one's not getting it. Let's try one more time. One, two, three, and. <laughs> yeah, she saw it from my way. She's like, that's mushy. I don't even want it. Let's give her a nice volunteer round of applause. I can't believe you don't want your grape today. Right. Oh, no. <laughs> grapes are gross. Yeah. Now, she, you, that, this also shows that with training, we actually, you would think that training a bird to catch something it likes would be easy. Um, actually, we have to give her another reinforcement. She likes to be scratched on the head because what if she's not hungry? Then the grape just flies right by her face. <laughs> so um, that also, but it does give us an opportunity to, we, we, I learned something from an actor years and years ago that said, if you can't fix it, feature it. <laughs> so they said in the shows when the animals do something weird or something strange happen, or they don't do what they're supposed to do, we do try to put that into play. We don't ignore it and act like it, nothing happened because... You know, it's hard to hide that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, because these animals are different than, like, the poodle that was, that's kind of a specialized training. That's what that dog sort of does for a living. These are wild animals still yes. that you want them to maintain that wildness as well as being trained, right? Yeah, it's, it's sort of a balance because we're not wanting to show them like they're like pets. You know, yeah. they are wild animals, so we're featuring their natural behaviors. But also they do need to be trained and have that human-animal relationship, that bond with the trainers to be able to work in this environment because it's not necessarily you know, a normal thing for a hornbill that may only live with one other hornbill to be in front of 300 people. Yeah. So they need to be bonded with us and close with us so that they're comfortable with us, but also we train them to go in and out of the crates and they're comfortable in there. We train them to be in these different environments to focus on us. Um, and then sometimes they are more comfortable in their regular place. So like we have some animals that will only work on the stage at the zoo and they won't travel and that's fine. That's their choice and we make it about the animal's choice. It's not like we can force them to do stuff, make them do that. They get to choose and so sometimes even today, you know, we're thinking about like, you know, some of the animals we have today, it's like, I wonder if the last one's going to come out. So we'll see. Um, <laughs> but um, it is his choice, you know, and, and that's the way you do it. So it's a positive reinforcement, positive experience for the animals, but it is a lot to ask them as a wild animal different from a dog mm -hmm. that's domestic and raised for this and all that. So mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that's another challenge that we have when we're trying to do this and, and um, you know, but it, it, it makes it a lot of fun. I think all of us who work with the animals and do this love animals. We love being able to share them with people and we're sort of the outliers in the animal care world because most people who get into working with animals do it because they hate people. <laughs> So, no offense, but um, uh, so getting out in front of people, if you ask most zookeepers to get out and talk in front of people, it's like asking them to, you know, stand in front of a group naked. It's the worst thing ever. They hate it. <laughs> uh, some of them are not so bad. The years have gone by. They're not quite as bad as they used to be, but it is, it is a very aversive experience for most of them. And so, so your job is actually unique even at the, yes. zoo, at the zoo, for yeah. so sure. So we're, we're the weirdos. I mean, even we the zookeeper kind of the friends, misfits. they think we're strange. <laughs> Yeah, because of that. But, I mean, it's what we love to do. So it's the opportunity to get to share the animals with people and to share our relationship with the animals. And it is unique. It is our job. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. like we were talking earlier about working with the animals, 
it, it may look to people like it's easy. You just pick up a parrot and get it to talk. No big deal. But we're with them eight hours a day. This is our job. I'm spending more time with this parrot than I am with my husband and son. So <laughs> it's going to work well, hopefully. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> So. Yeah, so talk about that a little bit. Your typical show day, I mean, you because you have to care for the animals and everything else that happens at the zoo, and then all of a sudden you have to go for a show. What What is a typical day like for you? It's pretty crazy. We're very high paced. There's not a lot of time to get all the husbandry done in the morning, and we do have a lot of animals. How many animals do we We've have? We've got about 50 animals 50. that we take care of, and we're getting ready to increase the collection by about a third. Yeah. And what does that mean to, what does that mean to take care so, of 50 the, animals? We get there first thing. A lot of the animals, you know, we need to check everybody and um, weigh a lot of the birds and make sure everybody's healthy and, and good. And then it's a lot of cleaning. We just get to work with that. We've got to make their diets for the day. Yeah, wash dishes. Wash dishes and scrub and, and squeegee. squeegee and hose. And uh, and then we're all nice and sweaty to go do a show. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a changing room. <laughs> we have a little curtain we pull aside and we, you know, we all kind of powder up and, and uh, wipe the sweat off our faces and brush our hair and then go out and look like we haven't been cleaning all day. <laughs> yeah. And that goes on. We have three separate shows. So, you know, it takes 30 minutes to set up the show. So if we start setting up at 1030, so cleaning has to be done by 10s and start sh setting up at 1030, show at 11 to 1130, break down everything. We have to transport all our animals to and from the amphitheater to our building. So that takes some time. So the time you get all the animals back from the first show, it's time for the next show. And it's just uh, back and forth for the rest of the day. Yeah, wow. You have a little bit of time. And like this morning, for instance, you know, come in, clean. You know, I was doing some running around paperwork. And then um, we got dressed. We got the animals loaded up. And we had to take an animal up to the vet clinic. So on the way out, we dropped it off of the vet clinic and then just kept driving. And they're like, when are you going to be back? We're like, when we get back? <laughs> Bye. You know. So it, it does, it's definitely high pace, but I mean, we love it. And then even in the wintertime when we're not doing the performances, we still are keeping busy with keeping the training going and, and projects and things we didn't get a chance to do in right. the summer. Where do you do the training? Wherever we can. Wherever we can find space. Most of it does take place in our building, but we like to take over our cross center where they have like conference rooms and we'll go in there and there might be a lynx or a, a crow <laughs> or something random in there and that's always fun for visitors to see because sometimes you'll see people walking yeah because we went there the other day for the meeting i would you know it's always interesting to be there and to go into the room that has all the bird i mean because they're they're really close together We're and in there, yeah. you know and it is loud in there yeah <laughs> yes. it's, it's kind of amazing how close they are they all are together so i was kind of wondering where you did take them out for training That's yeah and sometimes just out on the in in the zoo in different areas we'll do the training and like our front desk person too is used to us just like walking down the hallway. It's time to practice letting the Sariyama, which is a big bird, walk down the hall. And she just kind of laughs. And, you know, it's just, you, you know, we laugh and say, well, it's a zoo. I mean, you came to work at a zoo, so there they are. <laughs> so talk about some of the audience responses to the, to the different shows. Like how do, the, how do, you have an audience range, yeah, from yes. infants on, uh, it's all ages, really. Yeah, I mean, we have everything from infants. It's surprising. Infants really love vultures. <laughs> and, and I, it's anecdotal, but I just, I mean, isn't that true? They just seem to, I don't, I think they can watch them fly and they seem to really plug into that. But um, I think we're always looking for that wow. I mean, people, we want them to just be like, whoa, that was something either they'd never seen or they really enjoy it. I don't know. We, we have, um, it's hard for us though, as performers, we know it's really hot outside in those days when it's almost 100 degrees and the audience is like this. <laughs> yeah, they don't look like they're very into it, but I, you know, we yeah, always get compliments afterwards. Yeah. So I think we're doing something right. But yes, they always, you know, it gets hot in the amphitheater. It's concrete steps. So I can imagine they're sitting on yeah. those stone steps and it's 100 degrees. Yeah, but we have, I mean, we do get compliments and then we have, you know, people seem to just enjoy it. And, and we feel like we've really hit the mark when people say, both that they've enjoyed it and they've learned something. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. we feel like at least they've taken one thing away, or, oh, I didn't know that, or, you know, that was... But, but I mean, it can be anything, because we can have everyone from, like I said, infants to seniors, people with special needs. It can be anything, and we have to be ready for all of that. And we want everyone to take something away from it. Mm -hmm. So we kind of do this balance, too, where we may talk about things where... You know, you come out and you look at your audience, like when you first walk out, you haven't seen them until you walk out with the mic on and you're ready to go, and you do a quick assessment, and you look and you go, oh, it's mommy and me day, I got two-year-olds and moms, so I know I'm going to kind of dial it down a little bit, 
or other times you come in and you go, oh, it's a, it's a mixed crowd, so I'm going to go up and down. I might talk lower down for these little kids that are over here, and then I might, so I might say things like nocturnal. That means they're up at night, you know. That way mm -hmm. it, I'm not throwing too much scientific talk at them, but I'm also not talking down so the audience, the adults there aren't thinking, oh, it's just a kid's show. <laughs> so yeah. I want, we, we really work hard to, to strike that balance, and I know that when we worked with y'all, um, you know, we have it at Vanderbilt too. You know, we have, I'll see the physicians will walk by and stop and, and listen. And so that's really intimidating because you're like, okay, well, then we need to, you know, make sure we engage them too. So I think, you know. Nah. <laughs> I always okay, tell them to get back to work. <laughs> it's not for you, it's for the kids. I know, I know. It's really hard, really hard to keep staff away. <laughs> yeah, so, they do come, I see yeah. them, I see them come up, they kind of creep around the edges yeah. and look in. Yeah, they try real hard. <laughs> So what, yeah, what do the kids do? Like, do they, are they able to, you know, move forward and touch them? And, I mean, mm -hmm. how, how does so, that actually so work? So Robin does a really great job. Uh, she's so good with our patients and families. Um, and she uh, makes sure that, so some animals, like they said, these are wild animals. This is not your cute little poodle that does tricks. And so some animals don't like to be picked up or, um have a shorter attention span um, and we really try hard for you know every kid that comes down there that generally it's an animal they can pet that they get a chance to pet it and some kids can't <laughs> can't physically um, go up on the stage to pet the animal so we'll let you know all those kids that can go pet the animal yeah. Sorry, I, you're I stealing really my you. thunder. Yeah. Her. Let me say, you and just and stole Mandy, her thunder. And this Mandy, this is one animal that you know very well. Yeah. Is it Fezzik? It is. Yes, yes. I he's love Fezzik. Yes. He's, he's a um, very popular, um, <laughs> well-known. Fezzik not only comes on, his, on our Nashville Zoo Days, Fezzik also comes for our Easter party, which <laughs> yes. is a big hit. Um, and he's shedding, I'm sorry. A little bit. And he sheds a lot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, Fezzik is, um, and we were going to give an opportunity, since you were talking about people being allowed to touch them, mm -hmm. and I thought, I don't know, if you want to bring the Purell, I came off without it. I'm sorry, Stephanie. Can you bring that for me? Oh, we yes, thought maybe, maybe about 10 people could get a chance to come up and pet him. He is shedding, so just so you know. But if you want to come up and touch him, and you can touch him on his back. And this is part of the experiences that we do, too. So he... Um, He's pretty friendly. Just don't touch him on his nose or his ears. But, um, yeah, you can, it, his sister, um, Robin, our outreach um, supervisor, also does pet therapy in her volunteer time. Mm -hmm. And she um, actually will take his sister, who is bigger than he is, um, to uh, lots of different places. And she's gone to the cancer clinic at Vanderbilt with oh. him, with, or with his sister, Who's named Patty? What kind of what kind of rabbit is he? He's a Flemish giant rabbit. This is a domestic species, and if you've touched him, if you'll use the Purell, please, because we want to make sure you stay nice and healthy. It's all about uh, keeping clean. We love um, hand sanitizer. <laughs> he does look much like a homeless bunny today, but uh, trust me, he is brushed and taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's rough when it starts to warm up. You got to shed. But he, he is a, um, really good about um, meeting people. And then when he's done being touched, he will hop away. Mm -hmm. um, or he'll give you the angry ears, and that's the sign. Yes. Walk away. Angry walk away ears are one ear down, one ear to the side. <laughs> and that really does tell us a lot. It, it's, it's part of understanding his body language, but that is something where it's like, you have pushed it too far, I'm done with you. And did you name him Fezig from... From yeah, the Princess from Bride. the Princess Bride. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, okay, a Flemish giant rabbit. And we're like, okay, the Flemish artist. And we're like, oh, no, none of those names are good. And, and then we're like, well, where else could we kind of look into names? And then, you know, we just, we kind of started thinking of Andre the Giant and went that direction. And that's part of what we do. We try to name the animals sometimes, too. It is for fun for us, but also to help foster that connection. So if people can think, oh, that's from The Princess Bride, I love that movie, and then they remember him, and he is kind of unforgettable no matter what his name would be, but they, um, they seem to really, it, it helps them make a connection. So um, some people, you know, don't like to anthropomorphize. You don't like to put human traits to animals and stuff, so they don't want to name them, and they want to keep them dignified and all this. Well, our job is to foster connections, and so names are part of that. So our personal philosophy at, at Nashville Zoo and also in our department is it's okay to name them. That's and do they, do they know their names? Yes, and that also helps with training. Okay. So we call Fezzik, and he comes in if he wants. 
Um, <laughs> I use magic lettuce. That always works. <laughs> yes, lettuce that flies across the stage. Sometimes when you forget things on stage that you need for the animals, someone backstage will kindly throw it at you. <laughs> so he had, we needed some lettuce, and one day it just flew across the stage. The magic hand. So yeah, he's, but he's a very popular, and he does, as you would imagine, a lot of different types of things. So he's good because he's big. He's good for shows, but he's great for those smaller programs, and he's so well-trained to sit. He has a yoga mat that has a rabbit on it, and he sits on that, and that's where he knows he's supposed to stay, and then he, um, he just hangs out there. I mean, he's just, he's a phenomenal rabbit and um, has really been a great, great addition to the zoo. And um, a lot of people think, oh, just a domestic rabbit. It's not exotic. But for some people where things like Jane, you know, the hornbill might be a little bit weird to make a connection with. It's just a weird-looking bird, and it's just hard to relate. They'll relate to a rabbit. <laughs> we find a lot of seniors really seem to connect with them, too. Um, it reminds them of childhood and stuff. So, um, and especially those who maybe have some form of dementia, the, anything exotic is just they just don't connect with, but they see something like the rabbit and they light up, and it's just a whole different experience for them. So it's really cool. So how did you get Fezzik? How do you get the animals at the zoo? Well, <laughs> well it depends. Fezzik, we've been looking for a breeder for years. We actually were looking into a rescue, but we couldn't find one at a rescue. So um, we, we found a breeder in Knoxville, and we went and got him from there. Um, but a lot of the animals, we, some of them are former pets. Scarlet was a former pet. Um, Jane came from an a exotic animal uh, facility. It wasn't a zoo, but it was a private facility. Um, and um, so it just depends. You know, some of them are born at the zoo, and um, we get them at other zoos. So it, it's a variety of things. And mm -hmm. some of the native animals we get are wildlife rehabilitation animals. So they came yeah. from Walden's Puddle, so like our possums and some of our um, hawks and things. So it, it just depends. But we do choose. We do plan. Mm -hmm. We do a collection plan. And... We pick animals and species based on what we know will work, um, what we know maybe that we have experience with, um, and what will also help kind of, you know, help people maybe, like I said, make that connection. So mm -hmm. yeah, we'd had a Flemish giant rabbit on our list for many years before we finally found one. So. <laughs> but I think he's ready. You ready to go? So, oh, Stephanie, yes, you, you, meant, you guys mentioned that you look over, you look after about 50 different animals. So do you have the certain section of animals that you look after and then a couple other people have a section or do you look after no, all of them? It's really important. Uh, there's five of us that work full time and we all have to have some kind of a bond with these animals so that they work for everybody. So we all work with everything. And that's so you work with the giraffes too? No, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, just in our building. Oh, okay. I wish. I love giraffes. <laughs> but no, just in the building. And we have such a variety from the parrots to birds of prey to the cats and some little oddball with porcupine or, you know, those yeah. type things. So, yeah. so who works in the reptile house? I bet, are they a strange person? <laughs> the reptile people? <laughs> we do joke they that come, they are. Do they ever come reptile out? reptile people. Do they ever come out and do shows like these? Never. <laughs> they hide from the, from the public. <laughs> the reptile people. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, okay. there's a couple that are, that are a little bit more about being out in front of people, but... It's Not kind of much. rare, though. Because you yeah. do have a big snake in your show. We, we do, yes. Yes, we, we actually had, well, are you thinking of Isabella? The, yeah, the, the albino? She actually passed away. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She was a favorite. <laughs> she was very old, and she had some health-related, you know, uh, age-related health issues. Yeah, and stuff. yeah. So that's a good point. Like, what do, you have to check the animals every day, and you can pretty much tell when something's up because you Absolutely. know them so well. And you have a, a veterinarian, uh, you have a clinic there at the zoo, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have two full-time vets, two full-time vet techs. We have um, two full-time um, hospital keepers. And um, they always have interns, externs. Um, there's a lot of them. And we're getting ready to build a brand new hospital. Um, we're raising money for that um, to, to promote the, or to be ready for expansion. Because a lot of people don't think about it, but we do have a full vet you know, clinic. It's got the x-ray, you know, the r machines and ultrasound and um, all of the stuff that we need to have their ability to do surgery and all of that. And a lab on site. So uh, we have to do all this there. And we need yeah. to have the facilities to do it. So our vet team um, works very closely with us. And what's great is we have a really good relationship with them. 
I've worked at some facilities where vet teams didn't really get the whole program animals thing, and um, ours really seem to connect with that. So yeah. they are very supportive, and it's great. They, mm -hmm. they really help us be successful. And so what is it when, when the animals come to the hospital and when people come to the zoo, what do you want the people to walk away with? Is, it, is the conservation message the most important um, message for you guys at the zoo? Ultimately, is that sort yeah. of a yeah. standard that you have to write into all your shows? And yeah, it's actually a standard that's something not only that we personally want to do and not only does the zoo want us to do, but AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, that gives us accreditation, um, actually mandates that, that every educational program that we have has some kind of conservation message, but they're pretty loose with that. So they can consider conservation message being something like, please, you know, um, appreciate these animals, or, you know, don't, if you find a box turtle, don't take it home as a pet, or don't get uh, exotic animals if, you know, mm -hmm. that are from the wild, that sort of thing. So um, it gives us a lot of freedom, but it does have to be there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we turn in all that material that proves that we have it. When we do our five-year accreditation, it's, uh, it was two four-inch binders, I think, worth, you know, several, I mean, it was an incredible amount of paperwork that we turned in, and, and the messaging was a big part of what we had to turn in, of saying that, yes, we do this in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, but we also are happy when people just connect with mm -hmm. the animals. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, speaking of connection, do any of you have any questions for these nice ladies before we bring out our final guest? Any questions out there? Go ahead. If you'll stand up and just say it real loud. Does someone have one? Oh, did I see? I see a hand way up there. Uh, he weighs about, I think the last time we weighed him, he was uh, 16 pounds, or was he more than that, Stephanie? I think, but they get to be about 18 pounds. Patty, his sister, is about 18, almost 20, or maybe she's about 20 pounds. Um, so they're big. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, up top. Oh, yeah, it, uh, toxoplasmosis is um, a parasite that is only passed through cats' feces. Not to be gross, sorry, you're eating lunch. <laughs> um, <laughs> zookeepers talk about all kinds of crazy things at lunchtime. This doesn't bother us at all. But um, the toxo is um, deadly to kangaroos because in Australia it is not prevalent in the soil. And um, it, it's, in fact, it's not there at all. So marsupials are very susceptible to it. Um, here in, in the New World, in uh, North America and South America, Toxo is in the soil. It's here. Um, it passes through cats, but also um, people can get it. And you hear about it with pregnant women. You know, they tell you not to, to clean the cat box and that sort of thing. But once you've gotten it, you actually have an immunity to it. And, um, and it doesn't make people typically sick. It can if you're immune compromised. But animals that are novices to it, that's what we refer to it, their, their systems don't get it. They don't know how to fight it off. Their bodies are not exposed to it, like kangaroos, can be very susceptible. And people dump off their cats all the time at the zoo. They think, oh, it's woods and it'll be taken care of. We have a lot of feral cats. So we do um, try to, to, to control that population by trapping and taking them to animal control. And our vet has a, you know, we, we do humane trapping. We have all these parameters. And, um, but it is a danger to our animals I don't think people think about. And um, so we did have some kangaroos get sick. Um, we actually got the drugs that we needed for them, and we seemed to have staved it off. But um, it was uh, devastating for our keepers. And uh, it, was, it was just something we didn't really think about um, when we built that exhibit, that it would be a problem. Yeah, I wouldn't think that either. So are, will the animals grow an immunity to it, or do they just have to take this medicine that um, helps with it? It's hard to know. They, they, it seems like some that have been kind of around are born in this area and more in the, so in the southern parts of the United States. It's not as much of a problem up north where the soil freezes because it can live in the soil too. Um, it seems like they do okay. Um, maybe they do better once they're older and then they have babies and their babies are okay. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't ever really develop the same kind of immunity we have. So they're on this drug um, right now, and we'll see mm. how, how they do. But so far, so good. And then but do the keepers just have to really clean the grounds all the time? Or? Well, we can't clean the soil. Unfortunately, it's really hard. But also, if a cat gets in overnight or something. So our nighttime security is always checking it, making sure. But I mean, yeah, you know, you yeah. can't have someone stationed there. In fact, we did have keepers that spent the night there all night a couple times, stayed up 
watching the yard. Yeah. Like, but you can't really do that all the time. Yeah. So yeah. Um, they've tried spraying bleach down, but then you kill the grass. <laughs> So, and it still gets in the soil. So it's, it's a difficult process. But actually, this really difficult winter of super, super duper cold might have been something that helped us. Okay. Very so. good. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. No, you know, she, that's why we have her in our, as a program animal, because the place she came from, um, he tried to pair her with a male, and she kept beating him up. <laughs> <laughs> I know. She didn't want a, a, a guy, and so she really was bonded too closely to people. She had actually been pushed out of the nest by her mother. She'd been hatched and raised in human care, but she was pushed out of the nest by her mother, was raised by people, and so she created this bond with humans, and so she actually, the guy that we got her from said he thought she would be happier in an environment where she could be in constant contact with people. So, some, so that is part of, like, like I said, what we do with our collection planning is we look into situations where it's like, is this animal going to need a friend? And some of them do fine when they have friends, and some of them do better alone. And so we really plan for that sort of thing. But sometimes things happen. And you may look for a long time, too. Like um, we looked for years and years and years for an imprinted, that's what you call it when they've been raised by people, imprinted kestrel. Um, which is a small falcon, and it took us like six or seven years to finally get one because we wanted to have it be close with us. So, um, you know, they don't, they're not always just out there, and you don't want to necessarily do that unless it's for a, a purpose. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, it, and sometimes it depends on the bird, too, and how it manifests that relationship. So, like, waterfowl kind of get very, you know, stuck on people, whereas Jane just likes to be with us. She doesn't do mating rituals, thank goodness, but, but she likes to have that closeness with us. So it's nice, but also it's a bit unusual because she has that relationship with several people um, and not just one. But we want her to be able to do that, so she's a bit different. So, so who we have sneaking up back here? <laughs> there he is. He's a little shy. Is it again shy. the kind of animal we can't let you come and pet? Hi, buddy. Come on over here. Beautiful to look at. Look, hey, it's Blitzy. Jack. This is Blitz, and he's Hi. still new with the uh, programming. So he's a little shy right now. He's like, this is a big room, and there's a lot of people looking at me. <laughs> Why is there a spotlight on me? <laughs> it's okay, buddy. Hi. But Jack has raised him from a cub, so he is very fond of her. And <laughs> come on, you can come up here. It's okay. Come on. She helps calm him. There we go. There we go. And they said he was he was wonderful in the programs when he was a kitten, and then he went through those teenage years. That's yes, true. The, the angsty teenage years. We learned that today. <laughs> um, <laughs> he uh, he he. He's about, um, he's going to be, what, four? I guess in May. He's going to be he's four. He was be born four. on the day of the flood in 2010. He is a Eurasian lynx, and um, he, he was born at the zoo, and you can't leave him with the parents because um, lynx are pretty solitary, and they only pair bond, you know, they have their mate, and if you leave the, the babies with him too long, the males will kill the babies. So we knew we had to kind of take him away. Um, and we raised him, but because we did that, we knew he'd need to be an animal that um, is either a program animal or go to a facility where he would be with another cat. And we decided to keep him for our programs here. And um, so he was raised for this, but when he got a little older and kind of went through that phase of where he would be pushing his boundaries and asserting his independence from his parents, um, he was doing it with us. <laughs> <laughs> and he's about 52 pounds or so. And they do kill reindeer in the wild. They can kill up to a 200-pound reindeer. So you, you kind of do what he wants to do. You don't, he doesn't do what you want him <laughs> to do. <laughs> so as, if, so as, if he's part of a program, does he, is it pretty much just like this? Like yes, still, he'll come people out. People get to just look no. at him. and. Yeah, he comes out. He walks out on a leash, and then he goes back up. But it's... The nice thing is, is that um, it gives people a chance to sort of see in perspective the size and kind of, you know, um, he's considered a small cat. 
So when you think about that and you look at him and think, okay, then those And he can kill are, a 200-pound yeah. reindeer? Yeah, they could. Mm -hmm. oh Mostly they'll hunt rabbits and things, hares and, and, and um, uh, rats and things like that, but, and birds, but they will kill yeah. uh, reindeer. He has huge, huge paws. When, they, when he spreads them out, it's, they're just massive. And, and he does have all his claws and teeth, um, so we didn't, you know, we didn't alter him in any way in that way. Um, so he, he is very good for us, and, but he is still very much a wild animal. So we, he, we work with him, we train him. He does get treats, though he didn't want any today. And um, we get beef roast, our commissary department at the zoo. We have full-time commissary staff. You know, we'll call them up. We need some more beef roast, please. <laughs> you know, stuff. they they treat us wonderful. They allow us to buy the good stuff. His favorite though is a guinea pig. I know. <laughs> yes. Not not alive already. Not alive. No, no. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, we don't do that. <laughs> though but he yeah. would probably enjoy that. We don't. We don't do that. But he he is um, a more impressive animal, especially for a venue like this where you have a bigger stage and need to kind of let people see things but also we do love sharing these these predators talking about how important they are in nature the things that they do the roles that they play in keeping nature in balance and um so they're just really important for that and the thing about talking about the performance piece with what we do we're in a unique position where you know we need to kind of be able to come out there like we were saying earlier and look good present tell people all this stuff but the real stars are the animals and so if we do our job right people don't remember us they remember the animal mm -hmm. so he's one that it's hard to forget <laughs> <laughs> so but he presents some definite challenges but we're responsible to him for his whole entire life we want to make sure that he is you know well trained well taken care of and that we have set him up for success long after maybe someone else has taken over the program from us so everything we do with him, we are always thinking ahead. Every training we do, every single thing we do, is, is this going to be working for him when he's 20 years old? Because mm -hmm. um, he could live to be 20, 25. So if we train him where he's just totally bonded to us and won't work for anybody else, well, that's not a good thing for him because we're not maybe going to be there in 20, 25 mm -hmm. years. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, his Blitz. name is Blitz. B-L-I-T-Z, right? Mm -hmm. Blitz. Born during the flood. <laughs> yeah, he was born during the flood, during the storm, so they named him for lightning. We had two animals actually get born during that storm. <laughs> that, uh, I guess it sort of brought on labor for those, <laughs> those poor mamas. But uh, he survived and did fine, and, you know, there was no damage to his exhibit. He was born just fine, like nothing was going on. It's just the, the storm, I guess, kind of excited things. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Blitz. Yes, and yeah. he'll go up when he feels like it. So yeah, he may be yeah here he'll for a leave while. when he's ready. So, um, do we have any other questions from you guys? Oh, is oh, there a problem a if you t when you transport these animals together? That's a good question. Um, one of the things that we do is that when we do train and work with them, um, they do see each other, and we don't want them to be surprised by one another. And it's harder on the, on the, the animals when you don't let them do that. So at some point in their life, they have seen each other through, you know, distance and such. So there's not a surprise. They smell each other. We're all in the same building. We're handling everything. They all smell everything. So there's no surprises there. But we use crate covers. We cover the crates up with... Um, um, and we place them in such a way, we train our staff to place things in a way where you're not putting them right next to each other or maybe it's the backs of the crates are next to each other so they can't get to one another. Um, you also have to not let, they can't get to the seatbelts or can't get to this or that. But um, having the vehicles, um, you know, having them positioned in such a way in the vehicle where it's safe is obviously ideal. And then like here, he's on that side, they're over here, they're all covered up and everybody's nice and quiet. And that's part of the training too. We do encourage them with positive reinforcement to be quiet when we've covered the crate so they're relaxed and quiet and calm so they're not making a lot of noise. Because it is true, if we had the rabbit and the lynx at the same time, it would end very quickly. <laughs> Hit rabbit is one of his favorite things to eat. <laughs> so... Sorry. <laughs> and it is weird for us to be taking care of animals that we love dearly and then feeding out the same thing to other animals, but it's part of life yeah. for them. <laughs> the circle of life. Yeah, as it very is. much. <laughs> very much so. Well, um, I want to thank, let's give them a, a big round of applause. We're always glad to have 
the Nashville Zoo here and to learn even more impressive things about Vanderbilt Children's Hospital, which we're already very impressed with anyway. So um, thank you guys for coming. And if you have any other questions, feel free to come up and ask. Um, but just enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you next month. Thank you.